So tell me a story about a challenge that was faced and how the learner or the school was better for having faced that challenge. I would say I'm thinking of actually about one of my neurodiverse learners. Hmm. He often struggled with emotional regulation. It would be very loud and dis and he would kind of bother everybody with his thoughts and opinions on something. So I had taken a class on some somatic yoga practices and like centering practices. And so I started to kind of do my own experiment where I would just sit next to him when he was in these states of overwhelm. And I would just start to do some things with myself. Mm. And then I would very calmly say, hey, do you want to try some breathing with me? No, I don't want to breathe. Okay, you don't have to breathe. So then I would just do these again and again on a loop. And all of a sudden, I saw him start to do them. Mm. And all of a sudden, I saw him start to calm himself down. And all of a sudden, I started. I saw him start to use it as a tool to where here's one of my neurodiverse children with autism who goes up to what's considered a typical peer who's in a state of overwhelm, mm. goes up, almost crawls like a little kitty cat next to her and says, do you want to breathe with me? And I thought, oh, like this, like I stood at the door and I, of course I cried because I cried 10 times a week, but I just cried at the fact that like, what an amazing gift mm. that he harnessed and he learned, he honed, he practiced he failed at he practiced again he was able then to share that with his friend who he was so sad to see how sad she was normally that would make him really angry but he knows he has to stay calm for her mm. so he calls up next to her and says hey do you want to breathe with me hey tell me what happened why are you so sad so all of a sudden this child with autism which people sometimes think he doesn't care about what anybody else is feeling is very in tune to how she's feeling. Mm -hmm. Is very in tune to wanting her to bring herself back down to a state of calm. And I look at that all the time, and I think, ha, you know, this is the the this is the highest case study research I can do is to watch them put into practice mm -hmm. things that maybe that they're shown, or things that we do with ourselves that they observe also, and then they share with their friends, there's nothing else in this world, I don't think, that we could do with children that is more impactful than, than that ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ability for them to apply it is, is just so significant. Yeah. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr. All right, hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools Vodcast. This is Don Berg, and I'm here with Amy Novak of Acton Academy Red Rock in Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to be able to speak with you. Yeah, yeah. So I like to jump right in with some storytelling. So okay. tell me a story about someone who really plugged in and took advantage of what you have to offer at Acton Academy Red Rock. Well, I'll go back to our first year and a very big part of the beginning of the year is setting up how systems will work mm -hmm. for the rest of the year so that they can really self-manage. Mm -hmm. And so those first few weeks are really, really important. We entered this time where we were starting to learn how to give feedback to, to each other. Mm -hmm. That was a very difficult thing for some of our new learners. And so we decided we were go going to embark on this drawing activity. And then we were gonna follow directions on how to draw 
they could choose what they wanted to draw, but we were going to follow the direction, draw it, put it up on the wall, and then do kind of like this gallery walk where we got to leave feedback for each other. Well, we had one, one boy who really, really struggled with the fact that people were looking at his work. And he said he felt like they were judging him, mm. like they were criticizing him. He was never used to getting authentic feedback to improve and make him better. So he was coming at it from this perspective of, hey, you're only telling me what I'm doing wrong. Mm. And I think I did all these things right in, in, my, in my own drawing the first time. Well, we didn't tell him that we were going to continue to draw this until we got better and better. This is a page out of out of uh, Ron Berger's right, right. kind of his 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 butterfly drawing. Yeah, and yeah. so we did a variation of that. And so he really he he cried. He ran away. Mm -hmm. We went through all of the emotions you could expect a seven year old boy to kind of go through when some, he feels somebody's looking at him critically. And the, the biggest piece of this is we did not give him any feedback. It was his peers. Mm -hmm. right. So he didn't understand that it took, I think we went through four drawings. He would probably correct me on that. I'm sure if he heard me <laughs> talking. I think he, we went through four iterations of his same drawing and it was interesting because the time, by the time we got to three and four, people were now starting to recognize things he'd changed and done really well in his drawing. Mm -hmm. He had to wait and kind of trust that process. And so talking about it, but then experiencing it were two very different things for him. Mm -hmm. And so I remember our first building, it was really tiny, a thousand square feet. We're mm. sitting in this little office cubicle. He and I, after school one day, his dad's waiting for him. And we're just talking through like, what were some of the hardest parts of doing this? And he was so upset and he, he was so, he was upset because he couldn't control how others saw his work. Mm. And so we went through and we talked through the, the emotion attached to it. We talked through what the point of this really was. And he really did make some great realizations about himself. He said, this is going to be the hardest part for me. Mm. And he was, you know, he was a young child. We were just coming out of, of uh, COVID school, I guess you could call it. And his parents really chose to not have him always be a part. So he wasn't you know, here he is going into first grade. He he didn't have that quintessential kindergarten year like every other child should have had. So he had no preconceived notion of school. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. this idea of somebody else, his peer, looking at him, giving him feedback was really really tough. It injured his 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 tiny little soul. And so we had to talk through those moments. It was big. It was huge. You know, he's now with us, still going into year four. Mm, nice. Every time it comes to teaching somebody new or who's not quite good and quite not quite good at receiving feedback from their peers yet, mm. he always tells the story and he goes back to, you know, this was really, really hard for me to hear. It was really hard to know that I wasn't perfect because in my eyes I was. Mm. <laughs> and when, when my, when one of you, that's my friend, I feel like you're judging me. But I learned that the only way to get better is by you telling me, hey, here's the line. Why don't you try working on this part? And I realized that you were here to help me, not to hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so that's where our feedback loop within our, our building has turned into. We're doing it for helpful reasons, not to hurt you. And so that changes our perspective and our mind. It shifts that perspective a little bit. And we've got a lot of amazing heroes that have gone through this process that have said at the end, like, it's one of the most valuable things for them because they're willing to take what other people have to say and listen to it. And then that translates into the real world where sometimes an adult might say something, they know how to speak and, and talk to them at their level. And that's where I saw the beginning kind of of 
this, this stage of when we are allowing them to kind of have the autonomy over what they're doing, how they're advising their peers, it prepares them for whatever life can kind of throw at them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They might have someone who's a supervisor that is more critical. How are they going to handle it in that moment? Well, they're learning that valuable skill right now in order to be able to receive some of that. And so I've heard from families, you know, they're so much more willing to listen during these guiding moments now, whereas before it was really tough. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. would, they would, all the emotion would come out in them. Right, right. Very cool. So now, one, he, one, one thing that, I, that, that is uh, particular to Acton is heroes. Yes. In the sense that it's it's a it's a jargon that you use in your in your context. And that's one I'm a little bit familiar with. But I don't think a lot of people are. And actually, even I think I, I'm I have sort of some connections to that, but but I don't know exactly what y'all mean by it. So so help us understand when you say our heroes, <laughs> and we're talking about the students. To give us a little more about what that means in the acting context. So within the context, you know, there's the great story about the hero's journey. You know, Joseph Campbell speaks at length about it. And having this journey where you're basically on this circular path that continues to evolve throughout your life. And there's always that first call that you make, which is your call to adventure. You know, come on, join us. Come see what we have to offer. And then there's this place we call, I call it three o'clock on our clock. At three o'clock, we have to choose to kind of separate from everything that we've known to embark on this new journey that we don't always know how it might end mm. because the beauty's in the journey. And so because life is, is cyclical and circular like that, the learning in, the, in our studios is exactly like that. You look at when they come in, we've got these timetables that we can measure, you know, when they come in with wide eyes, they're so excited, they're so happy. Then about six weeks in, they're like, oh, wait, wait, what? Like, <laughs> wait, what do you mean I can't just come tell you, uh, uh, you know, tell you that my neighbor is has a messy desk and it's going on to my desk? What do you mean you, the adult, aren't going to solve that problem? Mm -hmm. So then it comes from separating from how things have always been done for them and them learning and harnessing what their reality, what their world really is for them. And so we try to just be that coach, you know, mm -hmm. we don't have the teacher mindset. We have that guide mindset of, you know, this is going to be a really hard moment. What are some things you can do to prepare? We might talk to them as if they're a coach, encourage when, when times, when they're kind of going around on their journey mm -hmm. and they hit a wall where they're faced with like, am I a victim? You know, is it because everybody else is loud or is it because I'm also loud? Mm. You know, why, why am I not able to move forward? What is distra what am I, what are my distractions for myself? Mm. So being able to identify with a story, storytelling is important for us. So being able to identify with the story that follows the story arc and that we can align it to their own journey. Mm. Then it allows us to also take so many great representations from the world. You know, I was just learned about this, this other book about how there's writing in movies uh, mm. based on the hero's journey. And I was just heard a, heard a national speaker about the talking about movies and, and the hero's journey. And I thought, you know, this is a great way for us, us to also illustrate to our learners hey, here's what the journey looks like. Remember when it got really hard in this part? You know, mm -hmm. remember in the Avengers, remember in, you know, in Batman, remember when this part got really, really hard, but then what comes next? Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. just at the cusp of that. So that allows us those moments to kind of intervene. So they don't just put, I always say, do you have your concrete shoes on? Mm -hmm. They don't just put their feet in the concrete and stay in that one place, but they know that they can move on to that next stage. Mm -hmm. When they know about that, they're better able to prepare for the journey that lies ahead. So imagine having this from the age of five or six, you're having these discussions. So now all of a sudden, now you're a teenager. You know, as a teenager, you're still gonna get to the other side. You're still gonna go back to 12 o'clock. 
You know, mm-hmm. you're still going to go back to that spot on the dial. And so it's hard as a teenager. Well, guess what? Now it's hard. You're trying to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life. That's hard. But always know you're going to come back to 12 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And I think that that gives, that gives like hope. It helps develop resilience because they know what to expect that this is literally a pattern that's going to repeat mm-hmm. until until the end. And so we like aligning to that story because they are their own hero in their own story. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, we're being raised by our families, but they write what that story looks like. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're just happy to be a participant, whether we're their parent or whether we're their their guide or an advisor or a coach for hockey or baseball or soccer, you know, we're a part of that adventure. And so mm-hmm. when they own it, it it helps them, I think, buy into the decisions that they make for themselves. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Very cool. Now, one of the things that that I mean, the emphasis of the whole my show is is the agentic school, agentic aspect of of the schools that I feature, yes. which is why Acton is part of it. Is you've already described a lot of autonomy, support, and and shaping a relationship in a way that's not just didactic, you know, teacher delivered kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So help us understand what is like like the structure of time and space is a little different in an active academy as i understand it mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so the the other extreme that I, and, and a lot of the schools that i've interviewed are in the sort of free school movement and so they're sort of giving a lot of freedom to kids to you know make decisions about what to learn how to learn it and stuff like that mm-hmm. but it seems like and, I, and i'm not clear on this that active may have a little more of a structure around kind of what the day-to-day activities are not that they're determined I don't think that's true. That doesn't sound like it. But that there's a there's a way that it's structured so that they kind of know what to expect. They know what's coming. Tell us a little bit about how that how those that is structured. Like, is it is it you know, just kind of open spaces and they kind of self determine within those things, or what, how how do you do that? It is determined a little bit. I think this is the only part where the adult might have a little bit of say. It's mm. it's how the day looks. Mm. So if we were to spread out the span of time, what does the schedule look like for them? And so that is not to be said ever that it's set in stone. It is, here's the, here's the menu. So Mm. you've got your menu from the top to the bottom. Now you guys might realize, and this is about developing and making great decisions, you have to be able to make those decisions in order to make great ones later down the line. So if you've realized like, hey, my snack, I went 15 minutes over, can I go 15 minutes into outside? They're negotiating that time on their own. Mm. That's executive functioning. Mm -hmm. You know, this Mm -hmm. is what we want most adults to be able to do. They're able to negotiate their schedule, at least within within our building. They're mm. able to negotiate that because they're managing their own time. Okay. They're managing each other on their own time. So we do have, you know, we do have some learners that are so they like to have that schedule and they like to be bound to it and mm. they will not vary from it whatsoever. And then we have some that don't and some that are like, Oh, I'm 30 minutes. You guys have already been working for 30 minutes. Oh, I was over here doing this. Mm -hmm. So everybody always has that ability to make the decision. It's how do you, how do you then reach the, the amount of time that you need to give to something in order to do it well or do it with excellence? How much more time do you need to give than in the rest of your day? And Mm -hmm. it's them negotiating that. Mm -hmm. And they'll come say, Hey, I realized I did that and I did that. Okay. And I, I constantly say like, okay, like, I don't know what you just told me, but it sounds good to me because they still also want to sometimes just check in. And it's, it's crazy. Even some of our kids who've been with us for three years still want like that. Hey, just so you know where I'm at, uh-huh, uh, okay, uh-huh. you don't have to check in with me, but that's okay. So our day is semi-structured in that sense. And that really, one of the biggest reasons I think I have stuck to that is because of the way that our physical space actually is. Mm. It looks like 
a co-working space for an for adults, okay. except it's for children. So I have a lot of half walls and wide open space. Because of that, if we are doing something that requires concentration and kind of our flow, then it's quiet in the building, you know? And I mean quiet to be like, it's not, um, you won't fly drones in the middle of like right. core skill time because you know people are concentrating. You know, that's going to take place at lunch or after. So it's it because of the way that our space is kind of set up, mm -hmm. that's why we keep it. So this is a quiet working time. If you want to work in a group, we've got rooms with doors. You can go work in the library, my office, mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. office. It's their space. So that's one of the reasons. And also just the predictability as they as they're learning to develop, you know, the responsibility for themselves, it helps them to know and understand kind of what are they responsible for on any given day. Mm -hmm. But they know what falls underneath. I can go up to any learner and say, hey, what are you working on right now in writing? And they'll be able to go find most, not all, mm -hmm, right, I right. shouldn't say all, <laughs> most will be able to go and find and show me like, oh my gosh, look at my poetry I just wrote or Look at what I just wrote. It's it's very much a this continuum of, yeah, why not? I mean, of course, why not? Why wouldn't you make that decision? Why yeah. wouldn't you be able to do those things? And so that is kind of how we're structured. They even get to make a choice over the core skill tool they want to use. Mm -hmm. There's no single one set in stone if one works better because that's the type of, of learning that they enjoy or they're most engaged with, mm -hmm. then who, who am I to say, no, that's not on our list. Like, all right, so we get one, one for you, you know, or one for you, or five of you are going to do this. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. you guys want to do this as a cohort. They get to make those decisions. And then we do um, present challenges, but we never know how the challenge is going to work out. Mm -hmm. So we'll have an overall idea, you know, and that's quest that's our project-based learning time. How they use that time is dependent upon them. They have the they have their quest, they get delivered some questions that they go off and research, they come together, they discuss them in their Socratic discussions, and then they go on and they do the work and you just never know how the work's gonna turn out. We've had some beautiful disasters and then we've had some <laughs> disastrous disasters so uh -huh, uh -huh. where nothing works and yeah, so yeah. again the the most amazing part is them going through the process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and again just we're a coach on the side you know some days you have bad days and and you just need to feel inspired and so what can we equip them with what story can we give in order to inspire them to keep going mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, as much as taking off the breaks, we don't do a lot of break <laughs> or hand holding. If they have a thought or idea, it's just up to us to help talk through it with them. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they get to foresee whatever they envision. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things you mentioned is core skills. So mm -hmm. that's something that I think it's common to act in activity, uh, act in academies, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so what, what does that consist of? That's the English language arts and math. Mm -hmm. They can use, they have so much time that they'll use their online tool uh, to show and to learn at their own independent pace. Um, and then they have offline time where they'll engage and they'll play games, they'll make a game. They'll do writing or reading together. Often it's drawing and writing a story about their drawing. So we'll have a little group that will get together over there. I had somebody come in, and this will give you an example, or I guess maybe a picture in your head. I had somebody come in that for a tour that had heard me talk about this for a year and mm -hmm. never seen it in person. They came in, and they're like, and they, they're from the tech industry. They've done some tech startups throughout their tenure in the professional world. And they said, you know, 
I walk around this, this is like a mini tech startup. Mm -hmm. And I said, explain, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you found that answer. And, and, and he said that it was because like over here in this area, you've got research and development. And then over here, you've got this group obviously working where they want quiet because they're behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And then over here, you've got this group that's all got their headphones on and they're all working independently at this table. And then over here, you've got this group that's just flying a drone over the half walls and seeing if anybody notices. So you've got <laughs> all these different pockets. You've got like a design lab where people are being hands-on and they're 3D printing something. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I did, we never plan the day like this. I never know how it's going to go on a tour sometimes. Mm. But I took a step back and I kind of looked around. I was like, I've never seen it through those eyes before mm. that we really are like this innovative design think tank that just happens to have children in the building instead of adults. Mm -hmm. And so watching all of those things, you know, we've got to... We've got this group over here with the, making this cardboard army. They're all making like cardboard um, swords and weaponry to arm themselves with so that they can go into battle for this reenactment of some part of a book. Right, and then right. somebody, it's just, it's a, it's a, this, it's a really cool space. And when you envision or kind of think about what that looks like, that would be the picture I would put in somebody's head. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. So one of the things that, that is very important to a lot of agentic schools is what happens when the conflict arises. So you've got those kids flying the drone and somebody notices and then, you know, if that's a problem, uh, what happens when conflict arises? So I think our elementary learners are such a great illustration. So when conflict arises, they know immediately that they go to solve it themselves. And once in a while, we'll see the new learner kind of come in mm. and they'll be looking back and turning their shoulder like, aren't you going to do something about this? <laughs> like, wait, aren't you going to, aren't you going to intervene? And there's times where we're like, we don't know how this is going to turn out, you know, where we can see writing on the wall and we're like, oh, it's heated, it's heated, it's heated. And then in the heat of that moment, that child makes the decision, I need to take a break. And you're like, oh, like it's that it's these big moments. Sometimes we sit there and we feel like we're watching this movie unfold before our eyes. And so when that conflict arises, we've worked on different solutions together as a group. Mm -hmm. We do these launches often, weekly, like several times in a week, sometimes where we talk about hard stuff that might come our way what's a way we might be able to handle it. Mm. So it's almost sometimes like we're front loading that um, through these Socratic discussions, we're kind of front loading potential issues and problems that are gonna arise for people. And then they remember in that moment what to do. Now, there's been times where that doesn't work, mm -hmm. where we have four nine-year-old boys who are all super competitive, who say, you're out, you're out. No, you're out. I said you were, you know, and it's the back and forth and back and forth. And we just kind of turn and, and walk away and listen to the dialogue that happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 90% of the time, there's a solution. 10% of the time, they can't find a solution or mm -hmm. a resolution, but they will choose to walk away from each other. Mm -hmm. We have we have yet to have someone punch them in the <laughs> right, face. Right, right. You know, like a knock them out or, or uh, because they do know, like, we do have respect for one another, even mm -hmm. if we don't see eye to eye or agree, we do have respect for one another. And we learn that through these experiences, I might not always like the person that I'm with, right. or I might not want to be friends with somebody today. That doesn't mean that, that I'll never be friends. It means I need to take a break from you they're developing that within themselves. It's mm -hmm. not me saying you need to go take a break. It's, mm -hmm. it's them or it's another, an older learner intervening and they're helping to co-regulate with them. You know, they're mm -hmm. calm. They come into this situation in a calm way and then they see, well, maybe I should handle this calmly. Mm -hmm. 
And I've watched this happen. Actually, it hasn't just been older. It's been our youngest learners sometimes are the greatest show of this. Mm. If the adult <laughs> gets out of the way, they totally negotiate and say, well, I'm not going to sit with you. Well, I'm not going to sit with you. And then they go off on their separate ways. But two hours later, they're together again. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they're the greatest evidence of that, that if we take the breaks off of them, let them make those decisions when they're young, it does transfer with them. It's when we get in the way and we teach them the wrong way to do this, they, mm. they're, they're programmed to be like this. Most children are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's us that get in the way and, and remove that. And then all of a sudden place their ability to make a good decision in our laps. And it's not our job. It's right. not our responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's, like you said, front loading through. And, and as I understand it, there's sort of the use of stories very deliberately as part of that kind of seeds for dialogue. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so you're yes. using those stories to give them models of character of maybe conflict resolution, uh, but different ways to handle situations. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about, about how that, like, like, tell us about that process, you know, the interaction between stories and Socratic dialogues. What, what does that look like? So usually what happens, you know, we launch with a question mm -hmm. and then we might provide Hold on. a video. You're using okay. the term launch in a particular way. Could you yes. clarify what that means? So launch, if you were to visually look at it, it means to go up and to gain momentum towards something. So our purposeful dialogue, we consider a launch okay. because we want it to gain momentum. We want there to be more that happens. It's not just us kind of coming off the ground a little bit mm -hmm. and it's not linear this way. You know, we want, we want the dialogue to go up okay. until there's this resolution, which is our landing. And so when we launch this, we'll launch with a question. Okay they will kind of, it depends on the studio. Oftentimes it's, it's directed by them. Sometimes it's directed by a guide. Once that question is launched, there's some dialogue that happens. Usually there's evidence. So it's either a story mm. or it might be a short video clip of something that would highlight or create that visual in their head. And then we go back to, okay, so imagine you are this person who just so saw all of your friends go and spray paint at a park on this mm. new park bench. Okay. So after what we just saw, what did you notice? What were some things that you noticed about the video? What are some things you noticed about the person that didn't do it? What did you notice about the people that did do it? Mm. Okay. So now I want you to go figure out, is it right to follow the crowd or is it right to stand for what you believe in, even when nobody else is? even if everybody else turns against you. If you stand firm in your belief, does that make you right or, is, or are they right because they stand firm in theirs? Mm -hmm. So you might throw these questions out to them and then they have to go discuss it. Sometimes they will research it further. Sometimes they'll ask to step out of Socratic mode for the next day so mm -hmm. they can really dive in and research, come back in the next day kind of say like, okay, time out <laughs> is mm. done. Like now time in, let's get back to this conversation. I have more to say about it. Mm. And so yes. then now you've got kids developing a, pa a passion about something they feel really strongly about mm. and they had to put the words behind it. Otherwise, nobody's going to step over to their side. You want to try mm. to win people to come right. over and, and look at your viewpoint like, hey, I'm the winning viewpoint here. And so that is the way that we engage in so much conversation. Hmm. That's how we front load a potential situation. Right. You know, that's how we can say, do you remember that one time you had this, you know, this is how you felt. I'll use the example this year. Our question was, does power corrupt? Hmm. That phrase was used often among our elementary boys. 
They're letting power corrupt them. They're letting power corrupt. So we knew we had to have a lot of illustration about how power can corrupt people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so do you remember that one time we had the discussion about this person and how they let power corrupt them? Oh, yeah. Well, what were some of the things they looked at? What were some of the things that they considered? And so it gives them that, again, that visual cue to go back and say, oh, that's right. So maybe if I approach it this way, I'll get a different reaction mm -hmm. or action. Mm -hmm. And so we allow this then to be these guiding moments that we have. And it stands the test of time. It doesn't matter if we did it our first year, our mm -hmm. second year, or our third year. We can refer back to the first year and they will know exactly every time, every time at the beginning of the year, I know that Jack, we're going to have a conversation about feedback about week three. And I'm going to say, remember the first year? And he's going to say, my, how far I've come. You know, he's gonna, We can still reflect back on those moments for so many of our learners to get them to, to remember and use those as launching mm -hmm. points for themselves too. And then we always have a landing especially if it's been a significant conversation, one that's involved emotion, one that maybe didn't involve a lot of emotion, emotion that we felt that they didn't connect to. And why? Why didn't they make those connections? Mm -hmm. So we always have this landing as well. We don't want to leave everything up in the air. We want them to be able to grasp something, have some type of takeaway, even if it's I need to think on it for a couple more days and get back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They know they always circle back to what they promise they're going to circle back to. Mm -hmm. We rarely have to go around and say, Hey, what was, what did you decide on that? Mm -hmm. They've already made the decision and started moving forward. And we're just the last, you know, the last to know. So. Right. Right. So, so one of the things that, that Acton is characters characterized by is this commitment to the Socratic dialogue. So mm -hmm. really, opening a question now there may be the, a structure for a launch and a landing mm -hmm. but but it doesn't sound like landing is predetermined no it's just you're gonna land somewhere and we just like to know where that is, is that yeah <laughs> and and for you to share yeah what you got from this experience with your with each other mm -hmm. sometimes the landing might be on the schedule of the adult probably is not going to have a lot to do with it, mm. it only to listen. You mm. know, it, it provides insight sometimes and helpful dialogue for us in the future. But really, we're there. We just listen. Mm -hmm. So that landing is purposeful by them to bring to the table what they learned through this very snippet in time, something that they thought might be hard something they thought they'd never considered before. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is there a change in perspective? Is there, do you have more empathy for somebody that you didn't have before? Mm -hmm. Are you going to do something different in the future? So yeah, yeah. getting them able to come together and talk about that, I think is a, is a way to, that gives them a closure, I guess, on mm -hmm. the idea or thought or, or helps them finalize what their thought is. Mm -hmm. Now, does is there a context in which they're kind of deciding on rules and boundaries for each other? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What's that, that look always, like? That happens, again, at the beginning of our year. Mm -hmm. Those systems are really developed the first three to four weeks of the year. It's mm. supposed to be three. Usually we take about four. And during that time period, they're outlining what those systems will look like. They know, okay, we have to have these five systems of operation within our studios. We need to work through activities together to figure out what those systems are. So that's what they do. They'll go from how do we hold uh, our rules of engagement to like what's a system that's going to keep us on track and motivated to do the next thing. Mm -hmm. And down to... Um, what their schedule looks like sometimes, you know, that that's another system created. What do, what are some guardrails we need to place in order for all of us to live together in this little micro community? And that's, that's mm. how we approach it. You know, we we're living together in this community. What are our rules that are going to keep everybody kind of held to, 
I don't want to say decorum. That's not the, <laughs> that's not necessarily the word, but right, right. that keeps us to what our role is and in function within this little mini community or mini society. Mm. And you have the leaders, and then you have those who want to be the leaders, and sometimes are louder than the leaders. And then you have you know that starts to come into play, mm. and then you see the people who really will step up and take ownership over those systems. Those develop naturally. We don't assign them mm. that role. And then once those have developed, there are times where we fall into chaos. Absolutely, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I know those are the moments I need to send an email home to families <laughs> that say, hey, you may have heard today someone was standing on a half wall. <laughs> or, you know, you may have heard that this is what's happening. And I assure you, yes, it is. Uh, yeah. You know, and sometimes just validating what the child came home to say. And then some guiding conversation parents can have with their children. Mm. So I try to approach that. Usually I send that out. I approach it from the perspective of I'm a parent, you know, mm -hmm. this is what's worked for my kids. My, you know, what works for my kids might not work for you, but maybe you can take this idea and develop it further. And so by doing that, now you've got this 360 degree support for that mm -hmm. child as they grow and learn to develop and make their own decisions. Right, right. They stay to they stay true to their systems or they don't. <laughs> right, right. And and whatever the consequence is falls upon their shoulders. So it's their decision whether to rise or to fall during that time, as all civilization sometimes does. Are you going to rise or fall based on the systems that you're holding in place? Uh -huh. And, you know, our middle school fell quite a few times this year. Uh -huh. And then how do we rise from those? And so I think that that is what keeps it going mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the fact that they're holding each other, you know, accountable to those systems. Right, right. What's the, uh, what's the, it's, it's K-8? Is that? Um, yes. And then this year we started high school as well okay. so i've just got a few learners one of mine is is one of those but high school age eventually we want to get to grade 12 as great. well yeah so you're just aging up as your as your yes. cohort grows that's great that's yes. great yes. so speaking of parents what are some of the things that well, well there's two aspects to what i you know, my curiosity around parents is one is you've already indicated some of sort of offering a little bit of support just as a fellow parent mm -hmm. is there a is there a sort of recommended way or common way that that acton academies provide support to parents or is that sort of up to each operator it's up to each operator okay. i look at i knew one of the things that would be different about my acton is the fact that we live in las vegas and there is a lack of community somewhat here, mm -hmm. meaning support for the families. Mm. Uh, a lot of people move here away from their own family. And mm. so they don't have that family support structure that many people have. I moved here from the Midwest and I always missed that part of being able to, you know, your kids go to school with the same kids their whole life. In Las Vegas, they don't. Yeah, and okay. rarely do they ever do. Um, rarely will they even see this have the same friend year after year mm. because they're changing all of the time. So parents don't have that family support. So I always knew whatever I brought here, I wanted to make sure that parents felt supported. Mm -hmm. And especially because they're learning and they want something different for their child. And so we want to make sure that they feel supported in doing something different for their child and that there's a community for them. And so for me, it was important to always have great dialogue and discussion with the parent. To me, that was my job. Mm -hmm. My job mm -hmm. was to guide parents. Right on. Right guide on. parents is it, or the guide's job is to to guide the learners. And so that was something that was really important to me. And I've started to branch out and speak to a couple other schools about that because I think it's the one area that we do well is, is speaking with our parents, not always spoon feeding. That's right, right. different. <laughs> we don't spoon feed in much of the same way. We don't spoon feed your children, not spoon feeding, however, supporting you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we will do. And so those moments that are difficult, I always know I might get a parent that shows up 
on my doorstep or asked to speak with me and said, I'm really having a hard time. Okay, let's talk about it. Right. You know, there there is no right or wrong here. Like we're all we're all figuring things out as we go. So I wanted my role with the parents is maybe more significant than other people's role in other schools, but that was a value for me mm-hmm. that I wanted to bring to the table so that we could have a community of, um, you know, we all kind of want this journey where we're not in charge and our children learn to make great decisions without following everybody else just because yeah. they're making their decisions. So the parents really want to embrace and harness this. And often they have their own journey, yeah. you know, yeah. as parents. And so I look at my role is to identify that alongside them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So another aspect, you know, speaking of parents is, is, you know, you, you're recruiting parents, you're, you're, you know, you know, you're a business operator and, and you need to be recruiting people all the time. So what are some of the kind of myths in education that stand in the way of someone choosing Acton? Grades. Grades are always the biggest piece. Yeah. I will tell you, you know, there's this scene from this movie that I always go back to in my head, Tommy Boy, you know, mm-hmm. back in the 90s. It's a it's a comedy with Chris Farley, and he ta- he's trying to sell brake pads mm-hmm. for his dad's company. And the guy's saying, but you don't have your guarantee on the box. And he's like, but you don't need to have a guarantee because you know what's inside is never going to break. I, I'll back up. I, you know, it's my word. I'll back it up. And he's like, but the guarantee is not on the box. And that's exactly how I would describe selling to somebody who's not ready to give up a grade. Mm. They need to see the grade in order to understand that their child is progressing academically. Mm-hmm. We spend less time on academics, we spend more time on that social emotional human being. And so convincing them is doesn't work. Right. I, you know, I learned that <laughs> my first couple of years, you know, don't try to convince them. Mm-hmm. They either know that this is going to be hard and they have to let go of the grade aspect mm-hmm. or they aren't ready to embrace this yet. Mm-hmm. And I'll and I've gotten better about saying that. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. If I see this child and I think they're going to be so amazing and the but the parents not quite ready for the journey, sometimes I have to say I don't think we're quite ready yet. Mm-hmm. Here's some books I recommend you read. Yeah. Yeah. You know, here's a couple, here's a podcast you can listen to. Here's an audio book you can listen to, but it's it's the grade is the biggest Thing that stands in the way mm-hmm. is how do we measure success in a child if we're not telling them they're an A, B, or C? And I think, <laughs> wow, like that's actually the worst thing we could do to a child is telling them you're rated here, or here, or here. And by me, the adult. Right, right. And then I look at what does that develop into? Mm-hmm. I see this generation of 20 something year olds that's wandering the world and <laughs> they're they're not sure what they want to do yeah, and yeah. they're not sure what they even enjoy because nobody told them what to enjoy yeah and instead of waiting for the answer it, it's really it's really difficult really difficult and so that's where i unsell as much as i can it doesn't mean at the end i can't print out a transcript of course i can mm. sure i can you know, you're going to transfer to this school. You need this to go with you. Sure, you can have a transcript. Hmm. But that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it just it just doesn't matter. Hmm. It's 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 one way I think we actually hold hold children back. Right. Is, is by giving them this rating scale by an adult of right. like, you're just not worthy yet. Like, <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, how do you give a first grader a C? Right. You right. know, like it just it never made sense to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right on. So tell me about, are there resources or special resources or opportunities that, that your school, your, at your academy particularly provides like something that's, you know, really different from, maybe traditional schools, um, but something that's that's unique or interesting? I would say unique for me as as a as a small micro school as well as a 
and act in is I do, I do serve about 25% of my population is neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. So they're children with autism. And that goes back to my pedagogy, my belief system, which is that children need to be around all children, not just some children. Mm -hmm. And we do a disservice to um, both sides if we do not bring them together to live and exist together. Because the reality is in the world, one in seven children are diagnosed with some neurodiverse ability. And so if children are not learning how to work alongside help, both sides, you know, both sides help each other uh, develop empathy for somebody having a hard time, both sides again, then it, what was the world going to look like? Mm. And so I look at at division and how do you kind of eliminate that division and it's bringing them, bringing children together who are diverse. Mm -hmm. And so again, I think we're robbing children on both sides of this. If we are not bringing them together, if we are, if they're excluded to their own classroom because they might be loud at different times, like it just never made sense to me because if anything, those children have to learn to co-regulate with their typical peers. And it is a beautiful thing when it happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, I have such amazing stories of things that have happened on all sides of this, how they've just, they regulate their emotions together mm -hmm. and they look to their peer, you know, I, it's just, it's such a beautiful thing. And then we look at how our learners go out into the world and they approach and show an amount of character or empathy that other kids on the playground mm. at a park might not have. They won't be inclusionary, mm -hmm. but you can guarantee that our learners will. Mm -hmm. And they'll recognize it. They'll say, come play with me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of world I would like to be in. I'm certainly not um, Pollyanna, you know, I don't, right, right. I don't think that everything is roses, but that certainly is a world I want to, I want to live in more mm -hmm. is to see people include one another and not cast them to the side. Does so typically uh, the impression of what we're now what is now called neurodiverse children or an autism in particular is mm -hmm. uh, typically assumed to have low social skills. Mm -hmm. I know it's inconsistent. It's you know it's a stereotype, but is that you know in your kind of context? Mm -hmm. is is that is like is the neurodiversity a particular challenge in this autonomous environment or is it or, or is it even an issue i mean it really isn't an issue because they listen to their like a child who's neurodiverse will listen to their peer more than they ever will an adult mm -hmm. they're learning actually People think that they're not social because they're not immediately seeking it out like you might see, right. you know, but it doesn't mean they're not seeking it out. They are. They're just doing it in their own way. Mm -hmm. They still want connection to a, somebody else, to another human. Right. They do. I don't have anybody that wants to be all by themselves. Right, right. You know, they want to seek somebody out the way they do it might look differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's a discussion we might have with somebody that they really like hanging out or hanging around. And that child then begins to develop this relationship where they're able to share. Now, all of a sudden, we've got this peer modeling happening, which is like, hey, you know, we don't, you know, we keep our belly covered, you know, we right, right. wash our hands after we go to the bathroom, because that's what my friends are doing. Mm -hmm. So it creates this peer modeling that doesn't happen when you're only around children who are just like you, mm -hmm. you know, if mm -hmm. you're around someone just like you, you're going to copy what they do. And if they're not doing those things, then you're missing out. Mm -hmm. And so we want them to do these things without being prompted. And so when you follow the lead of your peer, that is something that creates that it creates more of a long-term habit inside of, of them. So they're able to begin to advocate for themselves or to follow directions because their peers saying, hey, it's lunchtime, let's go wash our hands first. Mm -hmm. And they just follow them and wash their hands and then come back. And so it, it becomes this symbiotic relationship, which really is what children, specifically, you know, children with autism, especially children with Down syndrome, it's what they seek out. Right. You know, they really do want that 
symbiotic relationship with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's such a disservice not to give it to yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So, so one other kind of area where we'll, after this one, we'll start wrapping up, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about sort of the context of laws and policies in which you're embedded. So you're, are you private or charter? I am. So right. I am, I'm considered a private school. Okay. Yes. And, and mm -hmm. so what are the, are there things on your radar in terms of how state or local policies or, or laws are uh, affecting how you run your business? Absolutely. I've, I've got a loud voice for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> as, as most people do, you know, because it's not just a career, it's, it's like your calling. And so you realize you want to change it for others so that their path doesn't have to be so hard. As far as the state of Nevada, Department of Education, that is is actually the simplest part oh, of this okay. equation for me. I maybe it's because I was in the world of education, but mm. I can show what we do meets every need that's on a checklist for the state of Nevada. Okay. I can equate everything that we do within our time and space as being able to achieve a level of growth and development and education. So that was not difficult for me. Okay. The, the difficult part comes to, there's a lot of support, obviously, you know, in our state for public education, yet public education is failing and it's failing children who are in need the most. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that and knowing what research tells us that by creating school choice and opportunities for families to look at better educational options for their children, that creates more success for their child. And it al also creates a little bit of um, competition. Mm. So people are going to have to rise to the occasion. And so there is a lot of financial support for a public education system that is top heavy, mm. a lot of administrators, a lot of coops a lot of chickens in the coop mm. and the coop is a little too small. And so, or the coop is too big and they keep <laughs> trying to fill it with more, <clears throat> more chickens. And so we look at things and run them the other way. So we are mm. a, a, a bottom up. So the children are the most important for us and we kind of fall at the bottom of that triangle. And so, or at the top of that, that continuum. I think we have the biggest case for school choice out mm. of every state in our country. I read a mm. lot about what other states are doing, have followed their education systems, have followed the research and data being put in. We are a great state for the case of having great success but we're also a great state that wants to keep children down, mm. not able to always achieve their potential. And so if you create competition and you elevate the educational scene, I'm going to say a lot of things here. You're going to get a, uh, you're going to get a community and a workforce that's going to have to innovate. Mm. And in order to innovate, you have to separate from um, the casino industry oh. or you have to separate from the mining industry mm. to where you just need people to, to, okay, so we've got, here's this, here's this area. We only want to get you here. We don't really care if you hit here. Mm -hmm. We really need people here. So that industrialized era of education, that still works in the state of Nevada today. Mm, that still serves the purpose of the population of the state of Nevada. However, when you look at it from a broader perspective, 500 feet up, we're trying to bring all these innovative companies and organizations into our state because of our tax structure for businesses. Mm. Yet, who are they bringing in? Or who are they hiring? Right, they have right. to hire people from other states. That to me is a travesty to our children. You know, 
rules have to change. Mm -hmm. Laws around that have to change. Children are not a part of a game. Mm -hmm. They have a purpose to fill and it is really vital and important that they have that opportunity and there need to be laws in place that support that. And currently we don't have them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't have them. So, so Nevada's not a, you, so you don't have any mechanism to receive like any kind of voucher or any, like, is that? There is a point? small, teeny tiny opportunity scholarship okay. that was cut in half by about 47%, I believe last year. Okay. So there's been small schools that have had to close because a significant portion of their population received the scholarship. And, then, and when it was cut, there's a, there's a private Catholic school that was here for years mm. and it had to shutter, you know, shuttered stores because over 90% of their population were under-resourced children. And, yeah, yeah. and so those okay. parents don't have money. Yeah. 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 I just, uh, you know, it, it's challenging because every state has a different, you know, set up with regard to, you know, forms of funding, you know, charters, everything are, are all over the board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't study every state before I talk to my people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so so I, I I think I was at a conference in Arizona and was learning about, you know, it was, I think it was a state boards conference and I was talking mm -hmm. to someone from Nevada this was a couple of years ago, so it would have been before that cut. So uh, they were optimistic at that point, and clearly, situation changed. So we all were. <laughs> yeah, we all were. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's let's uh, start to wrap it up. So let's begin where we uh, end where we began with a story. So tell me a story about, and this is this is, tell me a hero's journey of uh, <laughs> a challenge that was faced and how the learner or the school was better for having faced that challenge. Let's see. I would say I'm thinking of actually about one of my neurodiverse learners. Hmm. He often struggled with emotional regulation. It would be very loud and just, and he would kind of bother everybody with, his thoughts and opinions on something. So I had taken a class on some somatic yoga practices mm -hmm. and like centering practices. And so I started to kind of do my own experiment where I would just sit next to him when he was in these states of overwhelm. And I would just start to do some things with myself. Mm -hmm. And then I would very calmly say, hey, do you want to try some breathing with me? No, I don't want to breathe. Okay, you don't have to breathe. So then I would just do these again and again on a loop. And all of a sudden, I saw him start to do them. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I saw him start to calm himself down. And all of a sudden, I, started, I saw him start to use it as a tool to where here's one of my neurodiverse children with autism who goes up to what's considered a typical peer who's in a state of overwhelm. Hmm goes up, almost crawls like a little kitty cat next to her and says, do you want to breathe with me? And I thought, oh, like this, like I stood at the door and I, of course I cried because I cried 10 times a week, but I just cried at the fact that like, what an amazing gift mm. that he harnessed and he learned, he honed, he um, practiced, he failed at, he practiced again. He was able then to share that with his friend who he was so sad to see how sad she was. Normally that would make him really angry, but he knows he has to stay calm for her. Mm. So he crawls up next to her and says, hey, do you want to breathe with me? Hey, tell me what happened. Why are you so sad? So all of a sudden this child with autism, which people sometimes think he doesn't care about what anybody else is feeling, is very in tune to how she's feeling. Mm -hmm. He's very in tune to wanting her to bring herself back down to a state of calm. And I look at that all the time and I think, ha, you know, this is the, the, this is the highest case study research I can do is to watch them put into practice mm -hmm. things that maybe that they're shown or things that we do with ourselves that they observe also. 
and then they share with their friends. There's nothing else in this world, I don't think, that we could do with children that is more impactful than, than that ability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the ability for them to apply it is, is just so significant. Yeah, yeah. That, that reminds me of a story I read in the New York Times many years ago about a school where the, the highest needs children. So these are kids with one-to-one, two-to-one kind of level of service need were in a, a special school that, that, you know, was for kids like that. But they were using a more democratic process to run the school, to, to help the kids with their, you know, to, with their day-to-day activities. And so, so because it was democratic, they were, you know, being more, not so directive, but more sort of, okay, how are we going to be? Now, one of the things that, that, they had to, you know, just state requirements is you have to do fire drills occasionally. And they had a, a setup where there was a very loud bell. And so there was one child in particular who sounds were an issue, you know, and the uh-huh. fire alarm was a big issue. And so he was volatile and they, they knew it was coming and they, you know, well, eventually they, they, you know, had the, the periodic freakouts and then eventually they, they started to have a more of a conversation with him and they decided to, they, they told him he was responsible for making sure everyone got out of the building. They gave him a job and that was in the, what enabled him to shift the focus from this loud sound to, I have a job to do. And my, you know, my friends are, are counting on me for this. Mm-hmm. And and it completely transformed his reaction. It doesn't mean he wasn't, you know, bothered, but by giving him focus and giving him monthly opportunities to practice that focus, yep. it really uh, transformed his ability to to function um, and yeah. and to find ways. And so it, it it's exactly the point you're making is that mm-hmm. that there isn't. Uh, a, a more important challenge in a human life of all ages is to be the master of your own attention. Mm-hmm. We were, you know, there's a huge thing right now about all the screens, which is a question I didn't ask you about, but mm-hmm. <laughs> I usually do. But but there's this huge thing right now, and there's a different response in the mainstream versus in schools that are focused on agency rather than academics. I mean, it doesn't mean academics is gone, but it means, you know, agency is the real focus. And that's how I, you know, why I invited an active academy operator yeah. on here, because I believe that's what you're up to. Um, and, and so everybody in the world uh, who has access to a screen may be struggling with it. But at the schools where agency is the real focus, it's not a question of, ban or not ban it may not even be a question of how to regulate it it's a question of asking the children do you want to regulate it how should we regulate it if we're going to do that and i've gotten a variety of responses throughout you know i've this is my second season and you'll be episode 14 the conclusion of the second season and 16 episodes in the first season so that's uh, 30 episodes <laughs> and i i don't ask every time but 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 it's Sometimes there may be limitations and sometimes there aren't, but what's consistent and I think that's most important is that the adults in the space are willing to have the conversation about it. Yes. And the focus is if we use these tools, what's the impact we have and what's the impact? Not just, are we learning better? That's not the Mm -hmm. question. The question is, how's it serving us? Is it supporting our well-being? Are, are we are we maintaining our friendships and our connections and our passion and our interests? That's the real question that I see uh, coming through. And, and, and even even you know, just describing how one child, neurodiverse, has challenges, but can then be a help and be the the conduit for bringing calm into an environment, into to a companion who's panicking. I mean, that's that's what it's really about. Is is creating those moments of community and connection independent of you know 
what, what, what their challenges are, what the challenge they're facing. So. Right. Yep. I, we could do another episode on, <laughs> on technology, but yes, you are right with that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I, I, I agree. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, some people might say you're not right. I don't know, but I, I, I agree. Like, with you know, that. I, I keep go, I go to conferences and things, and I'm I'm open to being challenged, and 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 actually, I have I you know am am finding that there are some people who it's usually not challenging in the big sense of of the bigger points. What they're really challenging is wait, is that how it really works? And that's a valid question. That's I think that is yeah. something that we really need to be discerning about. Is mm -hmm. you know, like for for the schools that are are. Uh, more traditional free or democratic schools is some people are like, oh, well, is that lack of structures? And well, one, it's not a lack of structure. It's a different structure. <laughs> it's a social structure mm -hmm. instead of an academic structure. But those are the kind right. of details we have to figure out and, and get clear about. So yes. let's let's bring it to a conclusion. Before we go, what are some ways that our audience can find out more about ACT Academy Red Rock? So really, it's going to social media, mm -hmm. speaking of technology use. Yeah. You know, that's where we try to tell the story uh, more. Mm, um, yeah. I, I put more and invest more in in that than I do a website. Of course, okay. we have a website, too, but it doesn't give the whole story. It's pretty minimal. Right uh, really, to find the whole story, it's to go into social media. Which channels are your preferred channels? So we're on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. And so okay. I not everything goes to LinkedIn. Sure. If you want to look at it professionally, let you know that's where you can find me. But as far as finding the stories of our learners on their journey and even us on our own journey and some of our families, it's at the Instagram and Facebook. Okay, great. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.